what should I do for Halloween this year? I know, I'll talk about a movie series that takes its inspiration from old horror comic books. I can't possibly see having any problems with that. Well, this movie wasn't put out by Universal, so I should be okay. Hopefully. Creepshow is a 1982 horror anthology that was a collaboration between director George Romero, famous for the Living Dead series of films, and writer Stephen King, famous for being, well, Stephen King. Come on, he's the most famous horror writer of the past 40 years. Don't act like you don't know who he is. Creepshow was intended as an homage to horror comic books of the 1950s, primarily ones put out by EC Comics like Tales from the Crypt, Vault of Horror, and The Haunt of Fear. But rather than adapting stories from these comics directly, they instead decided to recreate the look, tone, and style of the comics for the big screen using stories written by King. Which gives this movie the weird distinction of being one of the greatest comic book movies that isn't actually based off of a comic book. So we've got two titans of the horror genre finally working together for the first time. What could go wrong? Nothing. Sometimes I do movies I like on this show. What? It happens. So anyway, we open on a quiet suburban home during what I assume must be Christmas time. I told you before, I didn't want you to read this crap. I never saw such rotten crap in my life. Where do you get this shit? Ah, oh, come on. Zombie Tramp isn't that bad. Oh, wait. He's actually berating his son for reading a horror comic book. This has parallels to the real-life moral panic about horror comics in the 1950s, which actually led to EC publisher William Gaines having to testify before Congress that comics weren't a bad influence, as well as the creation of the Comics Code Authority, which imposed strict censorship rules that led to EC's horror titles getting cancelled. And a lot of that moral panic was stoked by this guy, Dr. Frederick Wortham, whose book Seduction of the Innocent alleged that comic books caused juvenile delinquency and almost single-handedly killed horror comics for decades. Ironic, considering he looks like somebody who'd normally be hosting a horror comic book. Oh well, might as well throw this in the trash along with his issues of Fangoria. Well, another successful day of disciplining my son. Now to enjoy a beer and get to work on my wife for letting my dinner get cold. You see that crap? All that horror crap? Things coming out of crates and eating people? Dead people coming back to life? People turning into weeds for Christ's sake? Okay, take it easy, pal. I'll give away the segments of this movie, alright? And don't worry about your dad, kid. This nice undead ghoul will help you out. Here's hoping this one doesn't also come with a bunch of bad puns. So the first segment is called Father's Day, and it's about damn time somebody made a horror movie about that. Why should all these other holidays get all the attention? I'm not sure why this family of rich douchebags is gathered together, but I'm assuming it's so this lady can kill some Dalmatians for a fur coat. Okay, actually they're waiting for their Aunt Bedelia to arrive. Isn't she the one that was supposed to have... Supposed to have murdered her father. Yes. Uh, if someone in your family committed a murder, you might want to be a little more discreet about it. Eh, what am I saying? They're rich. They'll probably be fine. Oh, hey, what do you know? At one point, Ed Harris did have hair. Mm, kinda. Oh, here's another thing you'll notice about this movie. At various points, the film makes use of fake comic book panels, backgrounds, and effects, since King and Ramiro wanted to not only emulate the tone of old horror comics, but also get the look of them down as closely as possible. Somewhere, a young Ang Lee gets inspiration. For a comic book movie that's not as fondly remembered as this one. They explain that years earlier, Aunt Bedelia murdered her father, Nathan, who is somehow younger than she is. <laughs> Alright, look, I know he's annoying, but there's no need to kill him. Just drop him off at an old folks' home and forget about him like everyone else does. Even though this movie successfully captures the look of old horror comics, it's surprisingly less gory than a lot of them were. Aunt Bedelia then covered up Nathan's murder by saying he died of autoerotic asphyxiation, and every Father's Day since, the family gathers to pay their respects by getting liquored up so they can piss on his grave. Unfortunately, Aunt Bedelia learns a harsh lesson about spilling Jim Beam on a dead guy. <laughs> 
Oh no, Nathan's back and he brought the movie's trademark red and blue lighting with him. Well, I suppose a zombie that says it wants cake is better than one that's hungry for brains. Even though Dan O'Bannon is the one who thought of that and not John Romero. Well, there's only one way to follow up a scene like this. That's right, with Ed Harris dancing to disco music. What, did you think that wasn't gonna happen in this movie? The real reason for this sequence was so Ed Harris could show off the new skinny jeans he bought. He also searches for a suitable place for a smoke break. Well, this spot looks like it's on the up and up. Nice of this cemetery to also provide smoke machines and mood lighting. Ooh, and it also comes with jump scares. You know, even without the comic book panels, Ramiro still delivers shots that look like they're straight out of old horror comics. Ed might want to be a little careful, though. Huh, that's kind of weird. Guess I'll sit here and see where it goes, though. Oh shit, a zombie. I should probably get up. I am curious to see what this stone's gonna do, though. Ah, it killed me. You know, I had a feeling that's what was going to happen, but I wanted to be sure. I don't think the zombie even needs to kill this lady, since by the look of it, she's been dead inside for years. Where is he? My dear, I really couldn't say. No doubt he's still out at the grave, hobnobbing with your Aunt Bedelia. Well, I want him. And I want my dinner. I'm hungry. Aren't there some servants you can yell at? Sylvia goes to find him herself, presumably so she can scare the zombie back into its grave. Mrs. Dell. Oh no, the servant's dead. Now she might have to do stuff herself other than drink and smoke. Oh, never mind, she's dead. Which in her case is probably a relief. Where is she? And where the hell is Hank? Go see Richard, please. Please. Hey, here's an idea. Why don't you look for him yourself if it's such a big deal? See? No reason to be afraid. There's nothing in here but more moody lighting. Well, maybe that's not quite all that's in here. Father's and I got my cake. Jeez, Uncle Nate, I know you're a zombie now, but you couldn't have sprung for an ice cream cake? And hey, the old EC comic stories had abrupt shock endings. Why should this movie be any different? The next story is The Lonesome Death of Jordy Verrill, and the title character is played by none other than Stephen King himself. Hey, it was the 80s. King was so coked up at this point, he also offered to do the lighting, editing, and catering on the movie just to keep himself busy. Anyway, King plays a country bumpkin who sees a meteor crash land near his farm. Now, it may seem a little egotistical for someone not known for being an actor to cast themselves in their own movie, but to be honest... That's a meteor. I'd be dipped in shit if that ain't a meteor. Oh, you done it now, Jordy Farrell. You monkhead. He's actually pretty good here. I mean, yeah, he's over the top and silly, but that's the point. He's playing a dumb hayseed. It's not like the comics the movie's taking inspiration from were subtle, so fuck it. Swing for the fences. I wonder how much they'd pay for it up to college. Uh, listen, Steven, I know you think this meteor is gonna make you rich and famous, but trust me, just write the novel Carrie and the rest will fall into place. Unfortunately for Jordy, he forgets that he's an inbred moron and ends up wrecking the meteor. Jordy Barrow, love kid. Barrel luck's always in. You spell that kind of luck B A D. I thought luck was spelled M O O N. Good news though, the meteor contains a brand new flavor of Gatorade. Maybe you could try selling that. Meteor ship. Mmm, probably not the name I'd go with, but you're brainstorming. All right, time for Steven to relax before he starts working on the script to maximum overdrive. And before anyone in the comments says anything, sure, I'll think about doing that movie too someday. Uh-oh, looks like jordy has got a Chia Pet infection. You better call the doctor, or at least fantasize about it. I'm sorry, Mr. Lerner. His fingers have... got to come off. No need for an anesthetic, Doc. Steven's so gacked up he won't feel a thing. And damn it, George Romero, quit having such stylish shot compositions! Didn't you hear the dad at the beginning? This is supposed to be trash!
Jordy realizes he's been infected with an alien fungus from the meteorite, although considering his living conditions, it was pretty likely he was going to get infected with a fungus anyway. In fact, not only is the fungus spreading all over his farm, it also brought some green lighting with it. Come on, movie, quit being so colorful. What, are you trying to be like a comic book? It Oh, right. Never mind. Well, there's only one solution to this problem. Get as hammered as possible, then hope the hangover is bad enough to make you forget about the fungus. But it may already be too late. Oh no! Not there! Not on my cousin, fucker! What the hell? What is the villain from Poltergeist 2 doing in this movie? Okay, actually this is Jordy's ghost dad, who explains that water is what causes the fungus to spread. Shit, it really is a chia pet infection! But hey, Jordy still has to get into the bath anyway. How else is he gonna become Swamp Thing? Oh, better! Oh, that's hot better! You know, considering EC Comics were known for gruesome twist endings, something tells me Jordy isn't gonna get rich off that meteor. He's gone. Just this once. Hmm, the sad end of Oscar the Grouch finally revealed. So the next story is Something to Tide You Over, which stars Ted Danson and Leslie Nielsen. Oh boy, this segment ought to be hilarious. That may work on TV, mister, but I can bench press 300 pounds. You better get your foot out of the door, you're gonna lose about half of it. Yeah, right, Ted. You think you can bench more than middle-aged Leslie Nielsen? Don't think so, pal. Don't call me mister. You know damn well who I am, so let's not play any games, huh? And don't call me Shirley either, asshole. Leslie plays a rich psychopath who discovers his wife is cheating on him with Ted Danson and demands that Ted follow his orders or else something very bad will happen to her. Leslie Nielsen playing a bad guy, but he only does comedy roles. If you ignore his filmography before Airplane, where he was usually either a romantic lead or a bad guy. Yeah, turns out Leslie Nielsen had a long film career before the 80s. Who knew? And there's a reason Leslie played villains for much of his career. He's actually really good at it. You listen to me, Harry, and listen carefully, unless you let me in and talk to me something very nasty is going to happen to Rebecca. Yeah, and then you'll never know. And believe me, Mr. True Love, you want to know. By 11 this morning, it's going to be too late. Yeah, turns out that cold, deadpan he delivered comedy lines in is also really good at delivering villain dialogue. Now this is Comfort Point. I call my beach house Comfort Station. Is that camp or kids, Harry? Mm, I'd say this movie's more of a loving homage, but those words work too. Leslie tells Ted to bury himself up to his neck in the sand or else he'll shoot him. I do what I told you. This is what happens when Frank Drebin finally loses his shit and decides to become a supervillain. Well, look at it this way, Ted. This is still less embarrassing than your Friars Club speech. Money. Look, I am money. I'll give you anything. Just get, just get me out of this hole. Okay, come on, Ted. This was before you were cast on Cheers. We all know you're not rich yet. This ought to lead to some wacky hijinks. Is that great video? I love this stuff. Now, just look at the quality of that picture, Harry. Feel how hard your heart is beating, Harry? <laughs> How fast? Now that's gonna make it harder for you to hold your breath, isn't it? Oh right, Leslie Nielsen's a versatile actor who can both be funny and an effective bad guy. I forgot. Leslie leaves Ted to drown when the tide comes in. Damn, if only Ted Danson were able to breathe through his forehead, he might be able to stay above the tide. And I know I've brought this up in other videos, but remember when the idea of being under constant surveillance was considered creepy and sinister? Oh well, I guess we'll just have to get used to the fact that everything we do is constantly recorded. Alright, you killed your cheating wife and her lover. Now to sell the tapes to Faces of Death and make a handy profit. Before that, though, time to unwind by watching his Best of Marilyn Chambers VHS. Uh, Leslie, I don't mean to interrupt, but I think the smoke monster from Lost is at your door. Oh, my mistake, it's actually a couple of monsters from a Scooby-Doo episode. And wipe your feet, will ya? You're messing up Leslie's carpet. You can tell shit's getting serious because the camera angles and colors are going all Battlefield Earth. The main difference being, this movie doesn't suck donkey balls. Alright, if you're at all familiar with EC Comics, you can probably tell where this is headed. <laughs> Oh, 
You can't escape us, Leslie, unless you can walk faster than a shuffle and- Hey, where are you going? Get back here! Hi! Well, Leslie should have known. This movie was made in the 80s, which means horror movie villains can teleport. Oh well, at least it leads to more awesome comic book panel shots. And in case you forgot, Leslie Nielsen can also be funny. Hey! Gotta hold my breath! The next story is called The Crate, which is my personal favorite of the movie. Hal Holbrook stars as college professor Henry Northrup, who's married to Wilma, played by Adrian Barbeau. This is Henry and Wilma Northrup. Oh, just call me Billy. Everyone does. She tells people that because she has the same hairdo as Billy Squire. Henry's a little upset with Wilma always drinking and constantly belittling him, although he does look happy to be in a better movie than Girls Night Out. What's the matter with you two? You're not drinking? Oh, honey, these people are dry. Now take care of them. So, so when Parker Mary, told me that I was out of line, I told him he ought to get laid. Oh, God, Henry, what's wrong now? You wouldn't have to spend all this time playing Emily Vanderbilt. Or Emily Van Buren. Whoever that etiquette crotch is. I don't know what the big deal is. Wilma's drunken behavior isn't that different from mine on every live stream I've ever been on. Still, I think Henry might be getting a little fed up. Not a thing, Wilma. Everything's just fine. Oh, Henry, can't you do anything right? Huh? Huh? Well, that's sad. When they first got married, Henry's fantasies about unloading on her face were a lot different. I don't know why he keeps fantasizing about killing her. So she's a drunk loudmouth. Just wait a couple decades and she could get her own reality show. Oh, right. The story's called The Crate. A janitor finds a crate from an Arctic expedition dating back to the 1800s in the basement of the university and calls one of the professors to take a look at it. They better hope John Carpenter's The Thing isn't in there. Actually, the crate even says Carpenter on it. Well, I'm sure whatever's in here is completely harmless. <laughs> See, it just has more red and blue lighting. The crate contains a monster that was nicknamed Fluffy by the crew, who kinda looks like a monkey crossed with a wampa. Listen, don't worry about the janitor. We can just get one of the interns to clean up while we look for a replacement. No big deal. There's only one thing Fluffy hates more than being woken up from his 150 year nap, and that's people who don't have any horror movie awareness. I want that shoe. I wanna measure the bite marks. Maybe we can figure out what we're dealing with here. Let me guess, this guy has two days until graduation. <laughs> yep, I was right. Hey, come on, don't be afraid. Tom Savini worked really hard on these effects. The professor goes to Henry's place and tells him about what happened, and Henry's got the right idea. When booze isn't enough, time to bust out the prescription shit. Weirdly enough, not only does Henry believe the story about the crate monster, he also sees it as a perfect opportunity to get rid of his wife's drinking problem by killing her. Look, Henry, there's no need to feed her to the crate monster. I mean, I mentioned John Carpenter earlier. He'll take her off your hands. For a while, anyway. Hey, no fair dressing up like Dexter, Hal. I'm the only one who gets to look like Dexter in this video. Henry tricks Wilma into meeting him at the university. And again, if you're fed up with her drinking, you could just tell her to join AA. Killing her seems like it's going a little far. Ah, but what am I saying? If she went to AA, we wouldn't get more awesome Tom Savini monsters. Hey, honey, look, I found a crate full of vintage cognac in the basement. Why don't you go check it out? However, Fluffy picks a bad time to be camera shy. Same old Henry. Afraid of your own shadow. No good at departmental politics. No good at making money. No good at making money? What, did he win this house in a contest or something? And no good at all in bed. And I swear to God, if you ever touch <laughs> Hey, baby, forget about him. I'm a real beast in the sack. Just tell it to call you Billy. Henry then collected Wilma's life insurance money by saying she died of liver failure. First, though, he's got to get rid of the evidence. You know, for as cheap as jump scares can be in horror movies, when you actually take the time to earn one, they can be pretty effective. 
Fun fact, Fluffy's also how the mob got rid of Jimmy Hoffa. All in all, the perfect crime, I guess. So, the question is, what happens now? There's no evidence of foul play, I've seen that. Uh, three people you knew are missing, including your wife. I'd say there's a pretty good chance the cops are still gonna investigate you. Ah, well, it doesn't matter. Nobody's gonna believe Fluffy's testimony anyway. So the last segment is called, They're Creeping Up On You. And I'm just gonna say this right now, if you're even slightly grossed out by cockroaches, you might want to skip this part. Veteran character actor E.G. Marshall plays businessman Upson Pratt, who kinda looks like Larry Fine in his retirement years. And apparently he's also a big fan of Evil Dead. Pratt is something of a germaphobe, which I guess explains why his place looks like a Bond villain lair. Oh, I found another cockroach this evening, George. Oh, no. One of those big ones. Right here in my $3,200 a month penthouse apartment. $3,200 a month? Shit, that's almost enough to run a closet in San Francisco. If Pratt's so concerned about cockroaches, why doesn't he just move to Canada? It's too fucking cold for him up here. And in case you hadn't figured out that Pratt is supposed to be an evil rich guy... I just called to tell you what a monster you are, Mr. Pratt. And how I will rejoice when you're finally dead. Lots of people are gonna rejoice when I'm dead. No, when you die, people are probably gonna puke. You'll see what I mean in a bit. After Pratt gets finished taking care of his roach problem, he can unwind by playing his state-of-the-art 1982 gaming rig. First, though, a little dinner. Hey, don't get upset. Roaches are very high in protein. Oh, and if you think this is gross, buckle up, because it's going to get a lot worse. Looks like Pratt better call an exterminator. I was just trying to run down in my mind who might have a 24-hour fumigating service. I might be able to get Pirelli Brothers out here by, shall we say, 11.30? Pirelli Brothers? Okay, hopefully it's Dumb and Dumber Pirelli Brothers and not Three Stooges Pirelli Brothers. At least now I know what Joe's apartment would have been like if it had been made by Howard Hughes. One benefit to using roaches in your movie, you can kill them for real and no one will give a shit. Seriously, imagine this happening in your place and not immediately trying to kill every roach you saw. You know you would. And keep in mind, this was made in 1982. There's no CGI here. These are real roaches they're using. Good thing Pratt has a roach panic room. But wait a minute. I hope you die! <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's a reasonable response. Oh, and remember how I said it was about to get a whole lot worse? Well, guess what? I wasn't kidding. It's at this point that all the guys who brought a girl on a date to this movie realize that they probably weren't getting laid that night. So that's the last story, and hey, Tom Savini did great work on the effects for this movie. It's only fair that he get a cameo. Look, an authentic voodoo doll. Somebody already sent for it. Yeah, we can't get that. Damn, I never got any voodoo doll coupons in my comics. All I ever got were those stupid mail-order monkey ads. And before you ask, yep, that was a real thing you could get back in the day. Time for little Billy to get revenge on his dad. Ah, oh, teach me to throw away my comic books. <sighs> Ready for another shot, Dad? <laughs> and the moral of the story is, kids, if your parents don't let you read the comic books you want to, then kill them. Or... something. And you can't kill your dad. He still needs to stop the Silver Shamrock commercial from killing everyone on Halloween. I thought I'd leave mentioning that's Tom Atkins playing the dad until the very end just to see how many people said, Is he seriously not going to mention that's the guy from Halloween 3? I can't wait to read them all in the comments. Despite being pretty different from other horror movies at the time, Creepshow was still a hit at the box office, and it even got pretty good reviews, although some critics didn't seem to get the movie's deliberately tongue-in-cheek comic book tone. 
Which is weird, considering the movie makes this obvious right from the very beginning, and I'm not just talking about the fake comic panels. Really, the movie's tagline tells you all you need to know. It's the most fun you'll ever have being scared. This isn't meant to be a gritty, disturbing horror movie, it's a colorful, fun one. Although it still has an R-rated edge to it. All the tropes of the old EC horror comics that inspired it are here. The sick sense of humor, the bright clashing colors, the shock endings, the unlikable characters getting their comeuppance. In fact, this movie does a better job of capturing the look and feel of old horror comics like Tales from the Crypt than any of the Tales from the Crypt movies. And remember, I actually liked Demon Knight. There's plenty of scarier horror movies out there, but very few have the sheer sense of joy Romero and King clearly had paying tribute to the horror comics they enjoyed when they were young. And because the movie's an anthology, that left the door open to almost endless possibilities for sequels, which I'm sure means this went on to become a long and well-respected series. Right? Fuck somebody. But we're a damn rubber. Everybody's got the damn herpes these days. Uh -huh.